And if this administration gets its way, whatever health plan you have will be eventually bought through one of these exchanges. That's their goal. Put everybody out of business except those people who are in the exchanges. And your health care policy will include at least a $1 premium for abortion services. And you won't be able to have health insurance without that. And your health insurance premium will be used to help pay for the abortion of unborn children in this country. And your insurance company will not even be allowed to tell you that some of your money is going into those abortion funds. Already, those regulations have been written. And the only place where the insurance companies can tell people that some of their premium is actually going into this abortion fund is in the fine print of the policies themselves. They will not be able to put that in any of their promotional literature because the government does not want you to know that you will be paying for abortion. And they plan to hide it from you. Huh. Folks, it's now. The time is now. There is not a tomorrow. There is not a next year. There is not a next decade. The time is now. In his first inaugural address, George Washington had this to say. 1789, the foundation of our national policy will be laid in the pure and immutable principles of private morality. The propitious smiles of heaven can never be expected on a nation that disregards the eternal rules of order and right which heaven itself has ordained. <laughs> Would for another George Washington to show up. See, our founders understood our founders understood that we were answerable to a God. Now, it's true they didn't all see and think of God the same way we do. It's really important to understand that, in fact. But they all understood that there was a God, that he was a personal God, and that he was watching over the affairs of men, and he was holding mankind accountable for how they lived. We've lost that in too much of our nation and in too much of our government. Our government and its desire to be a government for all the people, regardless of their personal convictions, has decided that what we need to do is we simply need to dumb down all this as much as possible so that nobody feels offended. And that nobody could or should be offensive to anybody's value system. Well, folks, I submit to you that if our founding fathers had that view, we'd never have become the nation that this has become. If our nation is dependent on heaven's eternal rules of order and right, we have got to understand the role that Christians play in helping our nation stand firmly on that foundation. It must be the church. There is nobody else. There is no one else to stand in that place and say, this is what we will do, and we will not do this other thing. We will follow God's standards, and we will insist that God's standards be followed, and we will not take another path, and we will stand in the way until the things of God are the laws of God and the laws of this nation. Now, Dr. Bergen pointed out, I hope this thing keeps working for me, because if it doesn't, we're in a, a load of hurt. All right, look at that. Dr. Per Bergen pointed out that we have two great mandates for our lives in the world. The first one, the Great Commission mandate, Matthew 28. You all know it. Go and make disciples. Evangelism is our first mandate. 
If the church doesn't do anything else, it must evangelize and it must make disciples. If it does nothing else, that must be done because there really isn't anybody else to do that. We have God's truth for salvation. There is salvation found in none other than Jesus Christ. All faiths do not lead to God. Well, not to peace with God. All faiths do lead to God, but too many of them for judgment rather than salvation. All men will stand before a just and holy God. Only those who have trusted Christ as Savior will enter into his peace for all of eternity. That must be our first and foremost priority. That is our first mandate. But fortunately, the Lord knew that we could walk and chew gum at the same time. And he also gave us a great cultural mandate. Matthew 5, 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Now, I read that a lot of times before I, some things dawned on me. The first thing that dawned on me a little while ago, not so long ago, believe it or not, was that these are declarative statements. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Jesus is not telling his disciples, be salt. He isn't telling them, be light. He's telling them, by virtue of the fact that they have placed their faith in Christ and been saved, they are the salt of the earth and the light of the world. The question for us is not, will we be salt? Will we be light? That question has been settled once we trusted Christ as Savior. And of course, we know what those metaphors mean. Salt is a preservative, it prevents decay, so we're supposed to be involved in preventing decay. Decay of what? Jesus helps us understand that as well when he calls us the salt, the light of the world. That word world is the Greek word cosmos. It was the closest word in the Greek language for our word for culture. In other words, Jesus was telling us that we are the light of human culture. We are the light of God's truth coming into human culture and pointing out error and pointing to truth. And we are the salt that prevents decay in the culture and gives it flavor. Our lives are flavorful. They show what a life can really be like. They show what happens when people align their lives and their values with God's values. And they show the world what really can happen in the lives of people who are submitted to the Lord's ways. And the only thing in here is an expectation that we would do what salt does and what light does metaphorically. That we would actually engage the culture in such a way that we make it better. That we improve it. And the only thing that Jesus points out here is the absurdity of not doing that. He's telling us it's absurd not to be light and salt and not to be light and salt and not do what those do. 